Evening Cherries fans and welcome to this exclusive video on here on Up The Cherries In All Departments. Before I welcome on my special guest, here is a little bit about our sponsors, Dental On The Banks. To find out all the services that Dental on the Banks provide, just go to www.dentalonthebanks.co.uk for all the information about all the products that we, they provide there. A massive thank you to them for sponsoring this channel. So my special guest today here on Up the Cherries in All Departments started his career at Sutton United. He then joined Harry Redknapp's Bournemouth so he joined us in 1990, scoring 21 goals in 62 games before joining title chasing Norwich. From there, he went to Wimbledon and then went over to Switzerland with Grasshoppers before coming back to finish his career with Sheffield Wednesday. It is a pleasure to welcome onto the show Efren Akuku. Thank you for joining us, Evan. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Not a problem at all. And thank you so much for joining us on this show. Um, so, firstly, let's start where it all began. Um, so, you started your career at Sutton United. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about how you got into non-league football and how you broke into that. But Your early days. Uh, quite simple with Sutton United, actually. Um, I picked up the phone one day, um, called Tooting and Mitchum, which was more local because um, I was living with I was living with my grandmother at the time. I just come back from Nigeria, spent a few years there uh, because they were the most local non league team. I think I used to we used to run sometimes, you know, past the, the entrance to the training route right to the ground, but nobody picked up the phone. So I thought, okay, who's next in the in a directory? I think I was looking flicking through the local paper. The next from Sutton United, I'd heard of Sutton, but didn't know where they were, didn't know you know who they were. Uh, but I knew that it was quite close, um, or I was told it was quite close. And um, I called them, and Barry Williams picked up the phone, who was the manager at the time. He answered, and and that's where I went, simple as that. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So it was, you had a successful career in non-league and was bought to AFC Bournemouth by the one and only Harry Redknapp. Do tell us a little bit more about how it all began your first your first impressions at Dean Court and um Harry's first impression to you well it was a big change obviously you know going going from non-league I'd only played uh about 18 months we saw him before I moved on um enjoyed it there and then yeah you know Harry came down to watch me I think uh so certainly once I remember but Stuart Morgan who was the who was one of the scouts then he watched me quite a lot, so um, I never had a chat with him, but I know that he'd tell me quite a few good reports back to Harry. And Bournemouth were, you know, buying a lot of non-league players at the time, you know, with uh, not being as as uh, as flush with the cash as they have been in recent years, as yeah. you well know. Um, so, yeah, you know, just going from that 
non-league setting and training twice a week and, and, and playing, you know, to training every day. So that was, it was a challenge more for the body, you know, to begin with, because, you know, that was very difficult, you know, to get used to, to train every morning and, and then playing. Um, but yeah, it was, um, I chose Bournemouth because it was, I felt I had a greater chance of playing more games straight away. Um, mm-hmm. I had a couple of other good offers as well, you know, to go elsewhere. And, uh, you know, Luther Blitzer was down there. I thought I could, you know, maybe pick up a few things from Luther quite quickly, try and elbow him out of the team, as it were, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So, you know, there were quite a few things that came into play um, as to as to why I chose, you know, to get to Cherry. So, yeah, it was it, it was an experience all around. Like I said, you know, the physical challenge you know, to start with to be able to make that, that jump from, you know, just, you know, almost like messing around compared to pro football is... Is a massive thing, especially when you've um, when you're turning pro late. So I was 22 when I signed for Bournemouth. One of the stories that Steve Fletcher actually mentioned um, in an interview I watched is mm. when they do bring players to Bournemouth. Now they take them round the beaches to West Cliff, yeah. Camford Cliff, so you mm. can see the area, get a real feel, yeah. and that's a real attraction to Bournemouth. Was it the same? Did Harry do the same for you? One word, no. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the beach was there. I think, uh, you know, I came down in the, I think, the March of 90 yeah. and spent a week with the club. I mean, <laughs> they, you know, they wanted to sign me, but I, I was a bit non-committal at that stage. And I think, you know, they just wanted me to have, you know, to have a good look around the town. So I've seen what the what the town had to offer. Um, I knew that was a nice part of the country. Uh, it's the first time I'd ever been to Bournemouth. Um, and yeah, so it was, yeah, you know, that's all you get to, you, you know, you you obviously use a local attraction if you can, um, you know, but I don't think that would have, that would have dissuaded me if, if there was no beach or anything like that. But certainly, you know, those things help, especially if you can do it around about May, June time, you know, when it's one of the best places to be in the country. So I'm not surprised that the club do that now. And yeah, you know, why not? But uh, I was, I don't remember the weather being particularly that, uh, or being particularly great when I, when I first went down there, but it never really ever got too bad weather-wise. So I think most new players coming, you know, I'd say don't be don't be afraid. I don't think it ever snowed when I was down there, and like that it was never particularly cold. So yeah, great part of the country to be. Um, and literally, I moved down from Reading years and years and yeah. years ago, and it's a beautiful area of the country and absolutely amazing place to live. I've seen it snow once though, Evan. I've got to be honest. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I did see it. Well, yeah, that, I did yeah. see it snow once, but um, yeah, it was um, everything was sliding around everywhere. But um, during your time here, um, you scored twenty-one goals in tw- sixty-two games. Hmm. Which goal particularly stands out for you from your time? That's a good question. Uh, uh, Huddersfield away in the in the league, I think ninety three. Mm-hmm. So that was my final season there. Um, yeah, that's the one that comes to mind quite quickly. But that was yeah, because, tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> well, because I've been injured out, I'd I've been out injured for a while. Uh, again, you know, I spent a lot of time injured. Unfortunately, but I missed about half of the half of the number of games available. Really, uh, but that one was particularly sweet because, like I said, I had I had uh, ankle surgery at the back end of the season before, and only started playing again. I think uh, back in maybe mid December or something. Um, so that was probably about five or six games back in. And, um, it was one of those games where I was I was still getting up to the speed of of the match returning, but I felt stronger and stronger. It was a game, you know, going on. It was it was smash and grabbing. You know, I think we outplayed them, and I just. I, I probably had I don't know, probably about three, three or four touches in the second half, and and two of those were maybe to control the ball, and the third was to score. So those kind of goals are quite sweet, especially when you won away from home on the road uh, yeah. one nil. So yeah, that's one of my favourites. But uh, I can't think of, of too many others right now that, or, or, or any others really, certainly from the league perspective that uh, stand out. There was a, there was a night there was a, a satisfying one for different reasons in the FA Cup at Chester away, which was the winner. I think we won three two. Um, <laughs> The, the mind is fading a little bit with those, Craig. It's a long time ago. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's true. A little bit, yeah. Well, certainly, you know, the Huddersfield one was, yeah, was a sweet one. Of course, you made a big jump um, up to Norwich City. So you went from playing in Division 3 to the top flight. 
And yeah. Norwich at the time were in a title challenge. I know that you eventually lost out to Manchester United. Mm. But when you arrived at Norwich, you, firstly, were you sad to leave Bournemouth? But because you scored three goals in that running as well, didn't you? Yeah, I got one against Spurs. That yep. Mark Robbins uh, still says that I stole off him. That I hardly touched it. It crossed <laughs> over the line. But yeah. It's mine. <laughs> and then I got two in the last game against Middlesbrough. But I spent uh, the first five games I signed on the bench, which was really frustrating because yeah. I was in good form. You know, when I left, you know, you know the cherries, obviously. And you mm-hmm. hope that you can just carry that straight forward through to your next club. Yeah, you know, the team was up at the table when I signed. But we yeah. finished third. We tailed off a couple of really disappointing performances and results, mm-hmm. more importantly, towards the end of the season. Yeah, that was a massive jump. I uh, yeah, you know, it was time for it was time for me to leave Bournemouth. You know, I'd um, yeah, I'd always felt that that when I signed up, I thought if I got one good full season in without being injured and playing well enough, you know, or maybe one and a half seasons most, that I would have attracted enough good interest. So yeah, I knew the time was right. I was coming to the end of my contract. Um, yeah. I would have been happy to resign, but it was, you know, there was a far less play power than where you can sign a new contract, then move on quite quickly. So, yeah, you know, the club were being offered decent money for me at the highest level as well. It was a great opportunity for you as well. And you took the opportunity as well um, in Europe. So the following season, uh, with, when Norwich were in Europe, um, you scored the first Norwich goal in European competition. Yeah. Um and also managed to help the club dispatch of Bayern Munich. Tell us a little bit of your memories from playing in those amazing nights. Yeah, unfortunately, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, start from the back, really. You know, the, uh, the Bayern Munich one, I missed, unfortunately. I was injured, I injured a couple of weeks beforehand in a strange okay. way, but that's another story. Um, and so I missed those games. I missed one of the Inter Milan games, uh, played the... Return like at the San Siro, which was the one where we finally left the competition. We played the first two against Vitor Sarnum. Yeah, that was it. Was a fantastic, uh, you know, couple of games. You know, for the whole, you know, for me, for you know, the team, for the whole city. You know, Norwich has had never played in Europe before and hasn't done since. So that was a massive boost, you know, to everybody. Uh, you know, to go from playing non-league football to playing in in European competition within a couple of years. It's it. Uh, it happens so quickly, you know, Craig, that you you know, you know hardly have time to think about it, if at all. And if yeah. you do, you, you're probably getting left behind on the pitch. So you sort of, you go with everything. If you know you've got enough, you you will just adjust to it very quickly. Um, but yeah, it was an exciting time, you know, for everybody. It was great to play at that level. Um, the profile already, you know, was most matches then. If, you know, there, there were a few matches on TV anyway to start mm. with. And if you're playing on a main channel like BBC, then... So in the whole country, basically, it's watching you. So it's amazing what people say to me sometimes, you know, something like 27, 28 years later, you know, the little things they say, oh, was so-and-so when Norwich played it. I remember when he did that. But, you know, there's games almost every, well, every day now on the, on TV. So yes. I don't think the yeah. profile for certain games will ever be the same again, um, unless you are playing at the super elite level World Cup finals, Champions League finals, because, you know, that's, you know, there's, Wall to wall saturation, but yeah, it was a great time. I enjoyed it. You know, Norwich was um, it was a nice club to play for. You know, some great lads over there, and it was nice to be part of it because you, the, you know you'll only ever be, or yeah, you know you'll only ever be the first person. You know, or I'll always be the first man to score the first European goal for Norwich, and 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 there's no first time round again if they ever do get back to that level. So that's a nice little thing, you know, personally. And it must have been brilliant to play in that side as well, because there was loads of great players who went on to have fantastic careers. Um, And some players that were coming to the end of their careers as well there at Norwich. Um, But you eventually um, moved to Wimbledon, which was um, quite... (laughs) Quite an interesting club at the time. Um, They were famously known as the Crazy Gang. Um, And that was in 1994. Yeah. You went there for £1 million, um, which, considering the size of the club that they were at the time, um, is quite a bit, quite a lot of money. Um, What's the craziest story that you have from your time there? Rob, this show is going to where, isn't it? It's not you and I just going to listen to it, isn't it? I couldn't possibly tell you about anything of interest that happened while I was at, <laughs> at Wimbledon. 
<laughs> I might be getting sued. Your, your, yeah. show, your show may be off the air very quickly as well. You know, really, there's a lot of that mystique and a lot of that uh, history with the football club and behaviours, <laughs> if you like, of certain players and certain things, you know, like people who have football club have, have pretty much yeah. left by the time I arrived, like I said, 1994. You know, the real crazy gang is early to mid-80s. By the time the likes of the more famous names arrive, in sort of yeah. 86, 87, most of the original crazy gang, like Mark Morris, who went, uh, who was at Bournemouth, who came to Bournemouth after I was there, they were the founders, Glyn Hodges, a few other faces like that, Dave Besson, of course, Alan Cole, Wally Downs, all those guys had gone, in fact, most of those guys had gone by 1988 when they won the FA Cup. So by the time I got there, six years after, I mean, that was old hat you know so people just like to perpetuate this myth that there was always something crazy going on that someone was having a bin put over their head or you know yeah. players were, were swimming with sharks and all that kind of nonsense and you know we drank raw blood before matches all that kind of thing so <laughs> yeah. it's uh it's not uh it's not true i can tell you um yeah. you know a much more professional outfit in many ways still behind of course you know clubs like norwich you know in terms of the <laughs> facilities in terms of preparation in some ways and of course, you know, three, four steps behind what Liverpool were doing or what Arsenal or Chelsea or Man United. So, yeah, a small club then, or very small club then, it's still a very small club now. And, <laughs> but yeah, no, that took away actually from a lot of the good stuff that we did as players and on, you know, on the pitch. You know, so people like to talk about that. And it's a nice story. I understand why Wimbledon was yeah. non a non league club from what, 18 years prior. To, uh, to that, so to see them rubbing shoulders with you know the you know the big boys in the country and look fighting for qualification for European uh, status is a big thing. I get that. So any little uh, angle, any little niche thing, you know that the players who come to the club has done the crazy if it's a Sam Hamam or kind of stuff, bringing an elephant onto the field before you know um, a match, a final home game of the season. It's good. It's good copy. I understand that. I know how the press works. But um, as I said, yeah. as a player that used to. Drive me a little bit mad because people just used to refer to that and not talk about you know some of the good players that we had and some of the good you know matches and you know and the teams that we beat not just now and again but always. Um, so yeah, you know det- detraction of football. And um, yeah. I remember Mark Morris actually saying to me when he came to Bournemouth, I asked him what it's like. Was, Wimbledon were always in the news. That's fair enough. And he said, yeah, you know, but he he said exactly what I'm saying to you. A lot of those all that stuff was nonsense, and it just detracts from what a good player that you might be. And in the end, you get no credit for when you play well. They're quick to have you when you don't play well, but when you do play well, they'll always say, well, one of the big boys didn't play well. In the end, he said, you know what? I sort of had enough of it and I left. And I always thought it was a little bit, now. what's he talking about? Kind of what a nonsense. But when you get there, you understand why somebody would feel that way. Uh, but, you know, yeah, you know, good times in, um, in different ways. And that was obviously my longest spell playing for a team at the, in the top flight. I remember... I remember that team really, really well. Um, And it's quite interesting, actually, finding out a little bit more of the background. And that wasn't a tag that you or your teammates really liked. But um, you were very, very hard to break down, Wimbledon. Um, Scored quite a lot of goals as well. You were the top scorer in your first season there, weren't you? Uh, Yeah, I believe so. I can't remember yeah. exactly how many, yeah, but that was punctuated, I think, by, well, I went there that sort of quarter of the the season and missed a few yeah. games, but, yeah, you know, it was, I was, I was, um, for Wimbledon, I was never an out-and-out striker, although that, you know, I had that <laughs> number nine, nine on my back and um, played up front most of the time. I'd, we played different formations then, you know, there's lots to talk about how, you know, these uh, new coaches are revolutionising the game and, you know, four three three and four five one and four two three one. Who knows what all side the combinations? But teams were doing that back in the nineties. You know, we all, we hardly ever played a four four two four five one. We played a lot of time four three three. I played on the left. At, you know, a lot of the time that's our my favorite favorite position. Actually, sometimes you know, coming in from the left. And uh, yeah, you know, we mix things up a lot. Uh, a lot, and you know, I was I was quite versatile. So you know, my goals tally is not always reflective of where I played on the field. Let's put it that way. But, you know, it was it was a decent enough ratio. But, you know, like with anybody, you know, strikers are all quite greedy. We could all yeah. we could all have scored more. And we, we all sit there watching TV now saying, well, if, if the rules were quite as lax as, you know, or stricter with defenders kicking, you know, they've got, got 40 goals like Messi, everybody says now. 
you know, not quite, but, you know, it's nice to yeah. pretend. <laughs> yeah, I believe, uh, I'm trying to wrap my memory back, but I think it was actually nine goals that he got that season, in that first season there. Yeah, I'm nine league goals, I think, yeah. I, think I, I got yeah. more than next year, I think, the, yeah, the one after that. So that was, yeah, like I said, usually punctuated by a few injuries. But, yeah, you know, I felt it was always... I was never obsessed with that number of goals. I was never that type of striker. I wasn't that greedy. It's all about just how many I can get. You know, I was much more of a team player like that. And, you know, I always had quite a few assists. I was quite happy doing a lot of other stuff as well, tackling and defending. You know, I started off as a defender when I was a kid. So that part of the game was always, you know, a big thing for me. And, yeah, I, I felt like I could do a little bit of everything. So, but, yeah, it's um, good times. In many ways, yeah, you know, very good times. Excellent stuff. So, of course, Evan, um, the other thing that I did want to mention, is called, of course, is Wimbledon. And there was, of course, a very controversial thing that happened to them with the relocation to Milton Keynes. What was your feeling with that? And how proud are you of the fans that followed you at that time? And what they did to actually yeah. build this whole new club, AFC Wimbledon, from the ashes and get them to where they are today. You know, Craig, that had been rumbling for many, many years since, I don't know, probably the mid-90s, not long after I arrived at the football club. And there was always talk about, um, or there had been for quite a, a number of months, leading into one or two seasons in the summer, and was talking about how the club doesn't generate enough money to uh, find a way to to do that you know can we get uh, or can he get land can he be given something you know to redevelop i know for a fact that a lot of that was was bs as they say in the yeah. industry because i've known people within the council who wouldn't say that they bent over backwards to help him out but they certainly offered him one or two sites over the years and he always found a way to pretend that the council weren't helpful at all i know the actual plots of land you know that he was offered in different parts of of the country because I've lived around there, you know, for 30 odd years. And um, yeah. Sam never really wanted to d- develop the football club in that way, certainly not with his own money. And people got frustrated, more and more frustrated, lots of the fans. And I used to, you know, engage with them when it got to a point where they started to be a little bit more vociferous at home, home, cra- home grounds in particular. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to highlight this fact. I was, I was always quite supportive if anyone in the media asked me, I said, listen, the fans have got a right to you know, to voice their opinion. They'll be here longer, long after I've left as a player, long after Sam and Ram has left. And they, you know, this is this is their club, isn't it? It's part of their community. Some of them have supported yeah. Wimbledon all their lives. Some of them were quite new, you know, coming into the Premier League, etc. So, yeah, you know, they can voice their opinion. So I was always on their side, but they always got drowned out, Craig. You know, there were quite a few. The Sifras, who, like I said, they seem to be the same, you know, hardcore group, if you like. And, I was on their side because um, I could see, you know, we didn't have any facilities, any training facilities to start with. And then we're renting a home at Crystal Palace and I sell their spa. So it was talk of going to Dublin. I always thought that was a load of nonsense. That was never happening. Going to Cardiff or going to Wales or so, somewhere else in Wales. Um, yeah, so Sam he was an interesting character. Let's put it that way, Sam. If you got him on one-to-one and we could have a personal chat with him, very often he would divulge things as a way of uh, showing you how sort of how sort of well he was doing, and uh, one or two things that he said to me, which I won't go into, but I read between the lines, and he never really wanted to invest his own money. Uh, so the perfect opportunity came when the Norwegians arrived with a lot of money to persuade him to sell a football club. He, he was more than happy to, and I always thought it's. It's about legacy. You as a player, what you did uh, individually, collectively with the rest of your teammates, and you as an owner. I think you know people want to, you know, would like to see if you want to be held in high esteem after you left the football club. What do you leave? Do you leave a fantastic training ground, you know, state of the art back, you know, comparatively speaking, back in the nineties. You know, okay, you sold the club, you sold the land, but you know, you left the training ground that new players can come in and, and be proud of. The fans can go and see, or everybody can see. Journalists can go and see. And be proud of. You didn't leave that. You didn't leave a land, you know, land or the football club that you know. So, okay, this I sold this, you know, to the new owners. They've taken it on. They've done what they've done with it. 
it's not my problem as it were so he, you know he didn't do either of those and that's what you know so if you go back to the football club afterward expect to be treated with respect and for people to still slap you on the back that's not going to happen that was the case with him he went back but the people the real fans people who followed the club a long time didn't appreciate it so i don't think he's shown his face since which is a shame for him really because he'll always be synonymous with the football club but in a way uh the local fans and i still see a lot of those guys i go to afc Wimbledon. you know he's he's not mentioned there's no there's no boardroom or there's no training ground or there's nothing named after him which considering how much of a profile he had with the football club throughout the 80s and 90s that's quite surprising isn't it you know, to think that somebody yeah. who's you know mr wimbledon as it were there's no recognition or there's no mention of him um so if that was me i'd be quite sad about that you know spent all that time at the football club and nobody really thinks that or nobody deems it fit to think that i have an association or not even welcome back to the new you know to new club but as you said i'm i'm, I'm proud of the people who um who've taken a lot of time and effort and money as well lots of coordination between themselves and with local with the local community to resurrect the football club because that's no small thing to go down or to reform and to i don't know how many nine promotions or whatever they've had I've lost count yeah. and to be where they are right now doing well uh, around that mid-table in um, in League One is fantastic and that's one of the, that's one of the great things about uh, about British football the, the system is fair all the way up you know is equal prize money um, it's not lost either as it is in Spain or has been you know Wimbledon is, is great I'm, I'm proud of everybody they've really got themselves together and reorganised you know and risen with a brand new team um, so they the move to Milton Keynes was, that's fair enough. I understand them, you know, moving, you know, they managed mm-hmm. to get a new football club, but I, I've got nothing against um, anybody there at all. I just I, I, just thought that they should never have used the word Dons, you know, just call yourselves Milton Keynes. A brand new town, brand new football club, fine, but I don't think they should be using the word Dons at the end. Uh, but that seems to be rumbling on. There's no love lost, as you can imagine, between the two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, of course, they've moved back to Plough Lane, which is, yeah. you know, a fantastic story fantastic. for yeah. FC Wimbledon. And, you know, full credit to everybody there. Um, and I've followed their story. I think there's 11, um, 11 tiers, isn't there, in football? And to manage mm. to get from the very, very bottom to, you know, effectively the third level of football yeah. is an outstanding story um and you know no long may it continue yeah, hopefully no fingers crossed too. one day you know they will be able to get back into the premier league and you know that would be an amazing end to what has been you I'll know to see it. A, a, yeah yeah most definitely most definitely it's one side that you know i've always got a bit of you know a bit of a soft spot for um considering the old wimbledon and what they've done since as well. Yeah, it would be a fantastic story. I mean, I, um, I've, I've done some work for uh, an American broadcaster on and off for about 12 years now. And I'm one of the guys who knows quite a lot about football. He's not new into it, sort of, since the MLS was founded. <laughs> watching football for 35, 40 years. And um, it's, it's a kind of story that they can make a fantastic program about. And uh, he did say to me, you know, it's... It's, it, it's the kind of thing that we would love to do. And I'm sure if one then got back up to the top flight, you know, like I said, I'd love to see it. It make, it would make a brilliant film. Honestly, it would make a brilliant film. Um, so, yes, who knows? You, you, you know, Brentford are up there now. Bournemouth yeah. have been there before. These clubs are all bigger than Wimbledon anyway, but Wimbledon has got more history in a way. And you, you would imagine that if they ever get themselves back into the championship, yeah, they'll be, you know, you'll see that. I, I'll be surprised if it never happened actually quite quickly that, you know, there's a Wimbledon back in, an AFC Wimbledon, I should say, back uh, back in the top flight. Yeah, honestly, it would be an absolutely amazing story. And then from Wimbledon, you went over to Switzerland with Grasshoppers. Um, how did that move come about? The last year or so, about 1998, Roy Hodgson was in charge of Blackburn. And they wanted to sign me. Um, Wimbledon played hardball and, and didn't want to let me go. Despite uh, quite a few good years' services, which really ticked me off, should I say. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, Roy got the stack at Blackburn and left and went. I can't remember where he went. I think he might have done some international coaching, uh, Finland or something like that for a year. And then he ended up in Switzerland, but he kept tabs with uh, my agent or whatever. Or anyway, so we, I'd been trying to leave with London for about 18 months or so. And I made it clear when the new manager came in, Aguil Olsen, that I wasn't going to stick around. So we had a <laughs> frank discussion, let's put it that way, early in the season, you know, around about August. And I uh, decided, you know, that it was time I finally left. So, yeah, I did, you know, I sort of forced through the move and um, they didn't want to send me, to, they didn't want to sell me to anyone else in the, in the Premier League. You know, just, you know, you know, turn down a couple of offers from a few people, I think, over the last year or so. And, yeah, and I thought, well, you know, I'd always wanted to play abroad anyway. I thought, well, this is a good chance yeah. to um, experience, see what it's like. And, uh, and I did, probably if Roy wasn't there, I wouldn't have gone. So I sort of had the contact with him already and yeah you know i thought that'd be a nice experience for me personally and i'm glad i went yeah you know sometimes i wish i'd stayed longer other times i wish i'd gone a little bit earlier but you know when the right opportunity or when an opportunity comes along you take it uh, there's never another firm offer to go abroad and um yeah you know great city nice people lovely club had a good time there and then you know but it was uh, like i said it was short-lived so do tell us a little bit more about when you returned back from Grasshoppers from Switzerland and joined mm. Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah, I was I was having a good time out in, in Zurich, you know, the air's nice and clean, living by the lake, fantastic. It really snows there as well, Craig, you know, you get a lot of snow. Does <laughs> it? Yeah. <laughs> so it was we great. From Bournemouth where world. it never snowed. <laughs> yeah, it's snow, it's a real snow, you know, uh, almost, yeah. almost to the date that they predict. Yeah, and I enjoyed it. Roy got sacked, unfortunately, midway through <laughs> the uh, first full season. Yeah, midway towards the end of the first full season, I was there. So that was a shame. You know, he was one of the main reasons that I came. You know, so that obviously puts a damper on things. And all of a sudden, the dynamic at the football club can change very quickly. They decide that you know they don't want um, some some high earners. You know, they want to you know cut costs, all that kind of stuff. Usual it's just football politics, which you, you don't always get too much at every football club, but, um, yeah, you know, so like I said, things can change very quickly. And But at the time, I actually wasn't thinking of leaving when, when Roy left. It was only when, you know, like I said, one or two things happened. And then, you know, things can change very quick, quickly in the space of hours sometimes. You know, from one training session to the next, you know, begin the one to the, to the end of the training session in one day. Uh, but, yeah, you know, the opportunity came. You know, Sheffield Wednesday were keen to bring in another striker. Um, the bottom of the championship, at it, I think, at the time. And uh, Wednesday, also Wednesday, is a very big club. Uh, used to love playing at Hillsborough, one of the great stadiums of English football. Sadly, forgotten in many ways because of you know the inability to get themselves together and improve that stadium. Um, so yeah, I was keen to go back, and you know, in a way, I almost didn't. I think I only knew that they were bottom or second bottom of the championship after. I had agreed to join, to be honest. I might not have gone much to stay where I was. Um, because, but yeah, you know, the whole, the stadium, the atmosphere, the city itself, cities, um, Sheffield's a great town. And yeah, I came, but was, you know, was was walking into a whole lot of problems there. A whole lot of problems, you know, financial problems. Players who didn't want to be there, let's be honest. You know, not just, not just European players, anyways. Always been easy. It was at the time, and it's easy now to say, "Well, things are not going well at a big club in England, and a lot of players earning, you know, big money, and you know, European players coming just for the money." Of course they do. But British players go to clubs for the money as well, and it wasn't just them who, who, uh, who, who weren't pulling their finger out. There was there was a lot of people who who weren't seemingly not bothered about doing their job. Let's be honest. It's a uh, is a way to describe it. And that's why the club were where they were, and that's why they've, you know, they've never recovered, was it? They got relegated in '99, same year as Wimbledon. And yeah, so it was, it was a tough one. But I've always thought, you know, you lead by example, especially as a senior player. And, you know, I did my best. A few of the senior players we pulled together in the end, towards the end of the first season, I was there, and otherwise we'd have got relegated again. But yeah, great place to play football. And um, I've not been back since actually since I left. I've actually not been to Hillsborough. Which is amazing, really. But um, yeah, I'd love to go back. I'd love to go back when there's a full house and when they're playing playing Premier League football. So it's sad to see, actually. Yeah, you know, one of the big clubs in the country is not 
has not been anywhere near the top flight, you know, for a couple of decades. And they've struggled recently as well, haven't they? Dropping sure, into awful. League One. It's yeah, yeah. It's an awful story yeah. and you know, of course their points deduction, which I believe was yeah. twelve and then got reduced to six, but yeah. It's a very, very sad story. And there was a couple of times when they nearly got back in to the top flight, um, but just missed out. It always seemed to be the playoff final, wasn't it? I think there was two in a row. Was it two in a row? Yeah. I know they've sort of hovered mid-table, but I, mean, I don't know what, the last eight or nine years it's been, you know, uh, flip-flopping, isn't it, between, or yo-yoing between yeah. League One and the Championship, which, which for a club of their size, obviously, is... Is devastating, you know. Sunderland now equally as big a club, you know, in the same division. Uh, teams like you know clubs like Ipswich as well. They've been in the top flight not that long mm-hmm. ago as well down there. Like I said, it just shows if you are if you don't get things right off the field, you, you've got no chance off the pitch. You can paper over the cracks if you top class players are coming and you know things look good on the surface, but underneath, you know, the house is crumbling and at Hillsborough it's been you know the bricks have been falling away from. You know, the foundation for 20 plus years. Um, well, I'm not sure what the owners are like. I think, you know, the owner, you know, current owners have put quite a money over the last, you know, few years or whatever, but still playing catch up with everyone else. You know, teams have been in the Premier League and have got themselves together financially a little bit more secure than you. They, they've got greater spending power. You need a miracle season, really, um, sometimes, or just an acceptance, some ways as well, Craig, that you actually, you know, just, just tell yourself right now, we are not a big club. We are nowhere near being the size of club that we think we are. Let's start to have a little bit more of a, I don't know, small-minded mentality. You know, let's do things in a financially much more prudent way. Um, easy for me to say from the outside, I suppose. Uh, but, you know, that's... It's a lot of the smaller clubs, it seems, in recent years, who seem to have been getting back up to the top flight or getting, or getting into and staying there um, in many cases. So, like I said, it would be nice to see them back, but, you know, it's a long way. It's a long way from where they are, you know, like with Ipswich and, and with Sunderland. Um, yeah, there's other teams who are running away from them right now. Oh, that's Brentford at the end, is it? Yeah, that's well. That's I mean, yeah, that's, it uh, certainly is. It's not. Um, actually, never. I just signed just to actually play, just to make the numbers up. But I never. Yeah. I never played for Brentford at all. I never played. I went. I did a couple of days training. Wally down there. Uh, was down there. It was just around. It was just down the road from where I was living. In Surrey mm-hmm. at the time, so I registered to play, but I never played, and I had no intention of making the comeback. I'd actually retired by playing Craig, and yeah, it was just I don't know. Yeah. The coaches always want an, an experienced red uh, head around a training ground if I can, but yeah, I just registered to play, but it's not. I mean, it's listed sometimes as a former team of mine, but um, they never paid me any money, so it doesn't count. No, but that's fair play. enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and. One other team I do want to mention, and we mentioned them right at the very start as well, Evan, Sutton United um, mm. finally got in to the Football League. Have you been back and yeah. how has it differed from your time there? Well, I've not been back for a couple of years now. Uh, one of four or five years. can't remember who I went to watch or why I was there, to be honest. had the plastic pitch at the time. They've now had to they have to dig that up, of course. You know, play on real grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, for them, you know, it's you know, once again, you know, I've lived in the in the around this community on and off for, for thirty odd years, so it's great to see that and the local team has been able to get themselves up into into the full professional ranks, as it were. Um, so yeah, it's I never thought that would have happened when I was back there in 1980, 89, You know, when I first arrived there. Yeah, uh, but it just shows. You know, that's you know, time. Time waits for nobody. You know, you can be a big club one year and just mediocre the next and keep on sliding. And sort of, they'll do well, you know, to stay up. You know, they've had one or two decent results, one or two decent performances I've heard as well. But no, I've not been there for a while, but that's another great story. You know, it's like, you know, clubs like Burton Albion and one or two others over the years, you know, for them to, you know, with no no history or no special uh, achievements, if you like, in, in football to be where they are. So, and then just, you know, just tell people, you know, for certainly in Sutton's case that, we're not just FA Cup giant killers, which they have been over the last 20 or so years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got, I do remember, wasn't it Coventry um, that Sutton beat years and years and years ago? Yeah, that's right. 80, 
89. Yeah. I was 89. actually at the football club at the time. Um, yeah. I started, I've, been, I've been training and, um, a couple of times, but I didn't want to change a team. He knew that I should have been in the team. Should have been in the team for that game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> my first, my first game. So I'd been training, but he, he wasn't. He wasn't taking anybody else. So I went off, and I was playing elsewhere. I was playing for my even more local team called Merton in the Southern Amateur League, yeah. which is just down the road from me. Uh, so the next, the next round, I lost to Norwich eight 0 which you know obviously was mm-hmm. you know, a great way to bow the competition. And then I, my first actually, my my debut for Sutton was the first game after that one. Yeah. Uh, was the first league game after losing to Norwich eight uh, nil. So yeah, a long time ago, but yeah, great stuff. So that FA Cup um, run, you know, did you well as well? Mm. Got, managed to help you break into the team. You know, I guess that um, they needed to change change things up, and you're pretty much ever present since after there that time. Yeah, we. Well, yeah. Sutton has always been a very uh, family club, very insular club in in many ways. Not willing to take chances, not willing to spend money. Really that's why they remained where they were, you know, in the old Vauxhall Conference uh, when I first arrived. And well known throughout non-league that Sutton weren't an ambitious club at all. Don't they even think they were interested in getting into the football league? Certainly had enough players over the years who've gone into pro ranks who could have, you know, would have been happy to stay with it. I think, or you know, relatively happy to stay with the club. And a um, hierarchy that was uh, powers that be that were shared a lot more ambition. And then I don't know what's changed in the last two or three seasons. Like I said, it's a bit of a shock. Suddenly, United in the football league, you know, playing full time stuff is uh, is still quite strange to hear that. But please, obviously, for the people who've been watching, you know, at, at the ground for many, many years, uh, because there's nothing like you know playing in a big time. You know that's where that's where most of the happy memories are for most people because you, you want to play. You know, you could be playing against Arsenal. You know, in the third yeah. round, in the third round proper. You know, after, after doing just one qualifying round as opposed to ten, you know, to actually get there. Yeah. So that's what people. You know, that's what players dream of. That's what the fans, yeah, we thought should, should be dreaming of as well. So yeah, yeah. Uh, good luck to them. Might get Sutton United against say, actually Wimbledon in. I don't know, in the third round. That'd be nice. I'll go and watch that one. Yeah. Let's be honest, if Sutton United managed to uh, get Arsenal in the cup, um, knowing the history, they'd probably win. <laughs> I don't know if they've met before. We played in a friendly. I, I played in one back in about 1988. And mm. I'm not sure they've ever met any massive match. But yeah. yeah, it's great. You know, that's what, that's what... That's what the FA Cup thrives on in many ways, isn't it? You know, giant killing, there's a giant killing, you can imagine, every year. Like I said, something I've had there a uh, few over the years. When we're going to certainly have theirs, that's, that's for sure. You know, one of the most famous mm. in a way. Um, so, yeah, that's that's why we you never, know. You never yeah, know. Yeah, definitely. It, it could be a giant killing. Um, yeah. As long as they don't do it to us, to be honest, Evan. <laughs> Yeah, of course. For selfish reasons, absolutely. Yeah. You went into punditry. You've mm. been part of the Premier League productions team as well. Um, do tell us a bit more about the media work. I sort of fell into that by accident, in a way, or a little bit prematurely, I should say, because I'd I did a couple of gigs for the BBC before I retired. Uh, but I, first, I real gig I did was the World Cup in two thousand two in Japan. Um, yep. Just by the end of the season, I've done a few things before. I was in, I was in contact with one or two people down there, race stubs. Um, I done a little bit of work with, and somebody pulled out long and short it for the World Cup in 2002. And Ray called me one day and said, uh, "Do you fancy going to the World Cup?" I said, "Yeah, what for? Are we going to watch some games?" <laughs> we had a bit of a chuckle about that. He said, "I have to do some work." I said, um, "Yeah, yeah, why not? You know, basically just thrown in." At, you know, at the very, very, very deep end. Um, and yeah, and I was I was on a plane three weeks later off to Tokyo, you know, do some commentating. I've been in a studio for the BBC a few times, but I'd never done a co-com before in my life. Mm. Uh, I wasn't afraid. I just thought, yeah, you know. I, uh, I was 34, I think, at the time. I understand the game. I can sort of bluff my way through it if, if you like. 
I've seen to one or two people beforehand, but you know, very quickly you have to develop your own style. And yeah, that was my first gig. Did I think six or seven matches? Had a great time moving around around Japan. You know, you know, saw some great football and came back. I think yeah, yeah. But I may have done the quarter final game. I'm not sure. Certainly around sixteen. I don't know how many teams were in the World Cup back. And so yeah, I, I never, I wasn't thinking about doing anything like that immediately. I wasn't even sure that I wanted to do it. Like I said, I even retired, and so I came back and then. And I retired later on that that calendar year, and then yeah, I was within a couple of years, I was doing stuff on a much more regular basis, primarily in the studio and almost exclusively for the BBC. At the time, uh, they were still uh, doing sport out of London then, as you know. But it wasn't until a couple of years later I started doing the co-coms on a regular basis, but, you know, for IMG for the Premier League. But that was uh, that was through the introduction with guys working for for, for the BBC. Um, so yeah, it just it sort of went quite organically in a way, if you like, which has been uh, how I've got most of my work. So, yeah, it's been great in that way. Excellent. And last question before I let you go. Um, what is your fondest memory, Evan, of any part of your time playing football? Oh, fondest memory. Oh, You know, I don't think anyone's ever actually asked me that. They always ask me about a specific game or, you know, a particular goal <laughs> like you did earlier on in the show. Uh, if I was going to put everything together, really, I would say... Um, i will probably say one match, you know. Um, you know, scoring four at Everton um, when I was at Norwich. Because that was a breakthrough game. Yeah. And... In many ways, although I had, uh, I think I'd, I can't remember the European games scoring the first European goal for night. I can't remember whether that was before or after now, to be honest. But they were there in about two weeks of each other. I think uh, I think the European game was beforehand. So that was a big moment because, like I said, all matches then with you know, in terms of European competition are most for on a terrestrial channel, and you know everybody has BBC. I think or used to. So that was a massive thing. Mm-hmm. That raises raises your profile. Then you become well known. Then you have to back up, don't you? Know, and keep doing. And people expect you know you know to do good things almost every time they see you. But the four goals was a landmark in terms of goal scoring um, in the Premier League. Anyway, first time that if that been done away from home, I was I was raised in Liverpool. I'm a Liverpool fan. I had a few pick you know friends from school, all that kind of stuff. So as as a moment or as a package, if you like, scoring and experience and everything. That you know, that one, it, I suppose, takes some beating. You know, playing for Nigeria for the first time was a great thing in a tournament as well. The you know, African combinations in '94. But in terms of me playing well enough, and like I said, you know, doing something that people will always remember. And that was a tough one to beat. And um, yeah, so I suppose I'd have to put one at the top. It's only the one that I get reminded about most. Uh, I have to get, I have to keep um, reminding people a little bit as well. I did score some other goals as well, you know, a few other games, you know, against Everton as well. But, uh, yeah, that's the one that <laughs> sticks out. So, it's hard to shake off in a way, which is no bad thing. You know, it's no bad thing yeah. at all. I'm back there this weekend, actually. So, Everton Norwich, I'm, I'm on duty. So, I'll do, Oh, excellent. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll go to some park. I'll get, I'll get reminded of that one more than once, I would imagine. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me on this interview, Evan. It's been an absolute pleasure for you to join me on here and all the very, very best with all the media work in the future and whatever you put your hand to in the future. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Hopefully I'll be back on at some point. Great stuff. Thanks so much, Evan. Cheers, fella. Take care. See you, bye. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining me on this special show here on Up the Cherries and All to Pounds. Please do remember to hit the like, the subscribe button and the bell button below to be alerted to any new videos that we do here. Please do also watch the videos that we've recently done. We did our Cardiff opposition preview. We had a very special interview with Jeff Stevenson after the QPR game. We do also want to mention at this point, our condolences to everybody who knew John Chalice, who played Boise in Only Fools and Horses. I know he was mentioned during the show with Jeff Stevenson. And our thoughts go out to everybody who knew him. He's a great loss to the comedy world. Until the next show, 
thank you for joining me and up the cherries. I'll see you then. <laughs>